Yeah, so Venerable um, uh, Dakey suggested that if I'm going to talk about my ordination, I could start by saying, 46 years ago when I ordained, I never thought I would be spending all morning talking about dirt and concrete <laughs> and rock walls and ADA parking and, and, you know, all this kind of stuff. Yeah, my dream when I got ordained was I was going to study, I was going to meditate, you know, I had no idea of teaching then. That was something that my, my teachers came up with. Um, but, but that's how I envisioned my life going on. Because remember, I was going to go find my cave and get enlightened in this life. Right. Um, yeah, but I had, you know, very much that aspiration to, to just practice and dive into the Dharma. Um, people often ask me why I chose to ordain, and uh, there were several reasons. One was when I um, encountered the Dharma, it was a spiritual fat path that uh, made sense to me. Okay, a theistic religion, I tried it. I tried very hard to believe in God. It didn't work. You know, it just... it. I had so many questions, and I talked to lots of different religious people, uh, you know, theistic clergy, and asked questions, and the answers just did not satisfy me. When I first heard about the continuity of mind from one life to the next and rebirth, I said, oh, that solves, that explains the you know, my questions. That gives me the answer to my questions um, because it brings in karma. It brings in basically what's the purpose of my life, which was the, my, my uh, very deepest question that I had had for years and years and years and hadn't found uh, answers to. So that, that was one big part of it. The second big part of it was, um, and again this happened at the first course I attended, uh, was to really, and, and the first course was a retreat for three, it was a three week course at Lake Arrowhead, California. And uh, another point that really came clear then is um, how self-centered I was. You know, I had thought I was a pretty good person and, you know, reliable, ethical, you know, I did the right things. I, you know, I was a good human being. And when politicians lied, when, you know, because remember I grew up during Vietnam and the government was lying, you know, to, to us. Um, so... Just finally looking at my mind and seeing, because I thought attachment was the road to happiness. And, uh, you know, it's like, no, that's not going to work. And my anger was, I began to see how much anger I had. Mm, that's not too cool. And just thinking about karma and how I was creating my own experience, uh, through my negative actions. And that really woke me up. It really woke me up in, in a big way that the problem was not outside. The problem was not society. It wasn't my parents. It wasn't this and that. Uh, the problem was what's going on inside here. Uh, so after this first course, I, I went back and I started really practicing at home. I was a teacher during that time, and so uh, I had summer vacation off. And uh, during the course of, you know, just doing a lot of meditation at home, uh, I had this very strong feeling that if I don't explore this more, I'm going to regret it when I die. And I always had a feeling of, I don't want to regret my life when I die. Yeah, 
I had the feeling that my dad, that it was something in my dad's life that he was regretting. I didn't find out for a long time after that what it was. Um, but I, I thought, no, I don't want to. I don't want to have any regrets when I die. So, and this is something that's important. I better just go for it. So I, I quit my job. I told my husband I was going back to Nepal. We had been to Nepal before. And, uh, and he decided to come with. Yeah. What's very interesting is the time that when we had been to Nepal before, we had spent uh, a year and a half traveling through Europe, North Africa. We went overland through the Middle East to India and Nepal. You could go overland in those days. And the furthest place we got in the trip was this little village called Tamu up in the Himalayas. Yeah, that was the furthest point in the trip before we came down and then we made our way back to the US. Yeah, that little village was the village where Lama Zopa Rinpoche, my first teacher, was born. Weird, huh? Yeah. So we had been to that village. We had gone to the the little local monastery there, and uh, and uh, came back to Kathmandu. I got a lot of the rice prints of different deities. I had no idea what they meant, but I thought they were really cool, you know. And I wanted to be cool, so we got these. We paste, put them all over our flat, you know, with all of our other souvenirs from traveling because in those days hardly anybody went that that route so we were like look where we've been and look what we bought mm-hmm, aren't we cool okay so in the, uh, in the course of of you know med- meditating after that first course i decided i was gonna go go back to india uh you know to kopan actually in nepal and go to the November course. Yeah, so Bob, my husband, didn't want to go, but he knows that when I make up my mind, I do something, <laughs> so he, he decided to come with. He had gone to another, uh, the Lamas, after they taught a course in California, taught one in Indiana, and he had gone to that, so he was Buddhist by that time, too. Um, so when I requested uh, Lama Yeshi and Lama Zoba to ordain, um, they said, wait. Yeah, because I, I knew within, within three months of meeting the Dharma, I knew I wanted to ordain, you know. Uh, and I wonder now if I had met the person I was then, or what I would think of her. <laughs> I would probably have said, you know, chill out, learn more of the Dharma. You don't need to rush off and ordain. Just develop a Dharma practice now, you know. But I knew, and there was no doubt in my mind, even though I had hair down to here, that it took me years and years and years to grow. And I didn't want to cut it, you know. But when I did the death meditation, and I mean, this is how I, how I dealt with my attachment to my hair, is uh, I imagined, you know, I'm dead, and the body's lying there in this coffin with beautiful hair, and people walking by, you know, because it'll be an open casket funeral, people walking by and going, oh, she had such beautiful hair. And I thought, yeah, and where am I to enjoy that compliment? Where am I reborn that I'm going to hear that compliment and say, oh, finally, you know, yes, don't I have beautiful hair? It took me so long to grow it. You know, it's like, no, that's not going to happen. This hair is just, you know, it's just hair. And so finally, when we got to Copan, I did cut it short, uh, like to here, and I put the hair, the hair on the altar inside my dorm room, you know, because that was my big offering to the Buddha was my hair, 
I, I was really giving up attachment. So I'd put not all of it, but one part, you know, one piece on the altar. And uh, my one of my roommates came back in and said, Oh, who put the hair on the altar? <laughs> And I'm going, that's my beautiful hair that I just sacrificed. <laughs> yeah. So anyway, Lama said, wait. I didn't want to wait. I knew what I wanted to do. I didn't want to wait. But your teacher gives you some instructions. You listen. You follow them. So I waited. So what the lamas had people do back in those days, this was 1975, um, was when people wanted to ordain, they had to go back to their own country and work or save some money, do something, because, you know, the Tibetans were in no shape to sponsor the Westerners and pay for anything, so we would have to pay for our own room and board and food and travel and everything, yeah, you had to pay to live in the monastery. So, uh, you know, we got sent back. Yeah. So my parents are going, ah, what happened? You know, our daughter is, you know, she was married to this very wonderful man, and, you know, she's always been a little bit, mm -hmm. <laughs> You know, her and her wild ideas, she dragged him to India one time before now, you know. So anyway, um, yeah, so I had to deal with that. My grandmother is saying to me, oh, if you, she didn't know anything about Buddhism. I didn't even explain that. That, that would have gone way over, you know. She's, she, you know, she was old country. And uh, she just knew I was leaving my husband, and she said, if you don't, if you leave him and you don't have kids, who's going to take care of you when you're old? Of course, I was 20-something then. I wasn't thinking about 72-something, <laughs> you know, in those days. Um, yeah, but she was quite concerned about that. Uh, anyway, I... You know, I, the, they had a, another uh, course in Yucca Valley when I was there, and I went to that. And uh, by that time, it was, yeah, almost a, a, almost a year and a half. And so I went to see Lama Zopa then and asked him if I could, you know, I requested ordination again, and, and he said yes. And so I came back. I traveled alone back to India, arrived in Delhi in the middle of the night, you know, uh, with, with a ta got in a taxi where I didn't know the driver, I didn't know anybody. My mother would have screamed if she had known. And uh, then got on a, uh, a train, overnight train, to go up to um, Patankot and then up to Dharamsala. And then, uh, you know, Lama Zopa are, uh, and Lama Yeshi both arranged an ordination. Um, so my ordination was on um, March 30th, 1977, okay? And uh, some, some of you were still in your previous life <laughs> at that time, yeah? So... Uh, so it was at Tushita, and Kyabje Ling Rinpoche was, the, uh, was my preceptor. And I was just, like, so excited to do this, because my heart was just totally in it. And, uh, yeah, so they, they ordained some uh, Tibetan monks as Geelongs, and then there were a few Inji monks, those of you who know Dr. Aid and... and um, George and those people, they, they took Geelong. Then there were two uh, Western monks, Jose Cabazon, uh, who's now a professor at, at um, Santa Barbara, and Buddhist professor, and then another German man named Helmut. He was the one who later carried me up the hill when I had hepatitis. So then they got ordained, and then, then two nuns, you know, and it was Susanna Perotti and me. So Susanna is now married to Maximo, 
um, yeah, who was the head of, he was the director of La Maison Kappa Institute when I was there. Okay, but he was married to somebody else at that time, and you know, Dharma Center, a mix and match. Um, <laughs> yeah, monastery, no, we don't do that. <laughs> um, yeah, so I, yeah, so I got ordained, and I was just uh, very happy. Um, Yeah, what had happened by then? I had recovered from from uh, hepatitis by then. I had been to Dharamsala before. Yeah, that's a whole other story. Getting hepatitis and then the the sangha. I think were you with that group of people who drag, who we flew from Kathmandu to uh, Patna and then went overland. Yes, so that whole there was a whole. I traveled with the Sangha. This was when I was still a lay person. So I was with, because uh, as soon as I got back to Copan, I, I asked if I could go to all the, uh, the Sangha pujas in the morning. I just wanted to be with the Sangha, you know. And then when we got kicked out of Nepal for visa problems, so the Sangha was going across to, to Dharamsala. So I traveled with them. It was May. If you've ever been in India, and Nepal in May. Yeah. Uh, they say you can fry an egg on the top of a car in Delhi in May. It's that hot. Yeah. And uh, they somehow, because I was so sick, and they just dragged me across. You know, this is refuge in the Sangha. They dragged me across India up to Dharamsala. Okay. And then after that is when I went back to the States. Uh, and then came back for ordination. So we haven't gotten very far. I wasn't sure what this talk was supposed to be about. I, didn't, I wound up telling you a little bit about my past. Maybe it was, you know, I should uh, say, oh, I was in the process of explaining why I ordained. Okay, so one thing was the answers. You know, it answered my spiritual questions. Um, second point was I had discovered that I was a little bit selfish. Yeah, not not as bad as some people, a little bit. But I had to do something about it, and and that involved karma because I I got the feeling like I have to do some purification, you know. Yeah, and and then I also thought I have to get my ethical conduct in shape because. I had kind of had a double standard. Politicians, wealthy people, corporate people, they lied. Yeah, their lying was terrible, disgusting. My lying, it wasn't as bad as other people's. It was basically I had to lie to protect other people so that they didn't their feelings didn't get hurt. Yeah. So this is the way I thought, you know, it's like my lies, they were compassionate lies, so that my parents didn't totally freak out, you know? Yeah. But then I realized, no, I, I have two different standards, and that's not right. I have to, if I have one stand, I have to have one standard for others and for myself, and so I have to get that cleaned up. And... Uh, you know, so in terms of, of uh, yeah, lying, taking things that hadn't been given, I didn't break in anybody's houses, you know, that kind of stealing. But, you know, the workplace and taking stuff and things like that. And so I, I, that was another very strong reason for ordaining. And then also, because my parents were so much against it and they asked me to leave the house. They said it was just, when I went back, they, uh, they said, this is just too painful. Please leave. Um, and, I, and I thought, you know, I don't want to hurt my parents. I, and I don't want them to be in pain about this. Um, but if I stayed and I lived the kind of life my parents wanted me to live, 
you know, I would just, I would create so much negative karma, just so much. And my parents might be happy a little bit because, you know, I turned out to be the kind of, you know, I was acting like I would be the kind of daughter that they wanted. But in the process, I would just create a ton of negative karma, make a mess in several people's lives, and let alone, you know, and then we have a horrible rebirth as a result of that. So it would make them happy for a little bit until I, you know, my bad actions in this life started to affect them. And then in future lives, how could I ever help them? Yeah, because I'd be in the lower realms. So, you know, I really thought this, this through very much and decided, well, no, I have to go ahead and, and get ordained. And in the end, in the long term, it'll work out for the better. The long term, I'll be able to benefit my parents. But just, you know, being the kind of daughter they wanted, um, you know, that's, that's not going to lead to... to uh, a good result in the long term for them or t or for me. Okay, so that's why I ordained. So we got that far, yeah, yeah. So next year, when it's forty-seven, I'll I'll give you <laughs> the next little sequel because <laughs> I think I was supposed to talk about the value of ordination or something like that. But but I am talking about it. Yeah, I, I hope I'm a little bit less, you know, crazy than I was before. Yeah, and I avoided at least, I mean, when I look back at the person I was there, I'm sure I would have just made a big mess of a lot of things. And at least I didn't make that big mess. I made other big messes, but, you know, but not, not really that those really big messes. Okay, that's it. The, the beginning. <laughs> the continuity. The continuity, okay. Questions beside when are we gonna eat? <laughs> yes. Do you think your grandmother would be thrilled to see how many people you have trying to take care of you? <laughs> she would say, where's the chicken soup? You're all vegetarian. <laughs> if they want to take care of you, they should cook you some chicken soup. <laughs> so I'd have to say, Bubby, vegetarian chicken soup. Yeah. Well, why didn't Lama Zopa Rinpoche ordain you? Why did he send you to Ling Rinpoche? Because that's kind of the tradition, you know. You you relay it. You have it. Your teachers, you know, or you have a higher t some a teacher that's higher in the rank than you. You ordain it. Yeah. Unless it's a situation. Like if the, when they ordain people in the States, they don't ask Gyamche Ling Rinpoche to come here and do that. They do it themselves, yeah. But in India, especially at Tushita, it was a walking, it was walking distance from where Ling Rinpoche lived. And so that was really good. I mean, that made a really strong connection between Rim, Ling Rinpoche and me. And I, you know, and I, subsequently went to visit him almost every year when I was in India, you know, to make an offering and to say thank you for ordaining me. Yeah, because I think that anything that I've done uh, of value in my life has been based on the ordination. Yeah, that's how I thought to start out the talk. Yeah. But really, seriously, I think anything good I've done, it's, it's because I've, I was ordained. Because otherwise, I tell you, my life would have been a mess. Yeah. I wonder if at that time you 
had been to the dialectic school, or dialectic school was already in in operation, and was there any Westerners there? Mm. There was uh, one nun. Her name was Tracy. And she was the only Westerner at the dialectic school at that time. Yeah, and it was pretty lonely as one Western nun being there. What about people like Gavin Kilty? I don't know. He, if he was there, I didn't really, it didn't register with me at that time. Yeah, because dialectic school kind of was its own thing. Yeah. When you were there then, weren't you? I was there since 1977. Yeah. Oh, so, okay. But before that, because I first went to Dharamsal in 76. Yeah, I was wondering before yeah. that. I didn't know him at that time, because I was mostly either at the library or Tushita. I see. Yeah, I, I was going between those two places. Yeah, but dialectic school, everybody spoke Tibetan. <laughs> I didn't know Tibetan, you know? And so I went to where the English, English courses were. Yeah. Anything else besides when are we going to eat? <laughs> yes. When did you make the connection with His Holiness? When did I make the connection with His Holiness? I went, I remember doing Vajrasattva retreat the summer of 76. And people talking, this was before I was ordained. And uh, People were talking about Dalai Lama, Dalai Lama. I had never heard of the Dalai Lama before. But okay, I kept that in my mind. We didn't get an interview to see him. I didn't meet him at that time. The first teaching I went to of his was uh, in this, um, the winter of 77. must have been like January, February in Bodh Gaya. He was teaching Shanti Deva, And uh, there was no English translation during it, uh, but Alex in the, uh, had a summary of what His Holiness taught for the English speakers. So I went to that every day. But I, I went to His Holiness teachings, sat there, didn't understand anything, literally, because it was all in Tibetan and no translation. But um, yeah, I'm glad I did it. Mm -hmm. But then the, the, the personal connection, the first time I went to see His Holiness, I can't remember what year it was, but I was ordained at this time. And uh, I wanted to ask, I had questions about karma. And that uh, the questions about karma turned into in volume... So volume two, I can't even remember what I wrote anymore. There was, I think it's chapter six, talking about the karma of the environment and where you're born. So that chapter came from that first time I, I went to meet His Holiness to ask those questions. And I think it was Lockdoor who was there, but he had trouble translating my questions. So they called Gareth. Gareth was there at that time. And he came and translated. Yeah, but that was the first uh, first time I, I met His Holiness face, you know, personally. Yeah. Okay. There's lots of other stories in there. I, I, I got to put in one more story because it has SK. Um, so when we... Um, in the spring of, no, the winter, sometime before, it was either end of, 70, end of 76, beginning of 77. No, it was end of 76. And you had to go back to the States, and Bob and I were going back to the States. And we traveled together. And we had a stop in Philippines. And then we flew to uh, Hawaii. Yeah, because we had the cheapest flights. And they, they were checking our luggage in Hawaii, and some people had taken, given us some Buddhist statues 
to take back with us. Uh, but, you know, it's like Bob had long hair, and my hair was, you know, shorter than his at the time. But, you know, we were dressed as 60, 70 kids. And then, you know, the, the, the pure nun coming with us, you know, who <laughs> we didn't corrupt. But, <laughs> yeah. Um, and they took the statues because they thought we were smuggling drugs. And they opened the bottom of the statues and took the stuff out. And we told them there was no drugs, but they had to see for themselves. And then we barely made it back onto the plane to go to L.A. Yeah. Do you remember? Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Yeah, they saw me dressed like this, and they thought, "Oh, here's another one." So, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right. I think they spent two hours searching every single bit of our luggage, and yeah, yeah, <laughs> no drugs. <laughs> we might have been stupid, but not that. <laughs> you know, you don't go through customs with drugs. <laughs> yeah. And then you were going to help start a center in Los Angeles or something like that? But it, a center I was never going started. to visit my family. I'd been away for four years. Ah. And then yeah. the Lamas came and t taught the course in Yucca Valley. I went to that. We, I think we were roommates there. And then after that, the momentum started to Vajrapani Institute. So then I got involved in that. Yeah. So were, you, were you living at Vajrapani at the beginning? I stayed in Los Angeles because that's where it all started. Because at that time, Vajrapani was just a forest. There was nothing there. And some people yeah. went and started building things. But no, I stayed in L.A. and helped mm. with yeah, so there wasn't the whole big FPMT thing at that time. Because I think Vajrapani was, Manjushri was the first center, or Chenresi was, and then Vajrapani was the third one. So. Okay, lunchtime. <laughs>